Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight we're celebrating the publication of the book No Way, Post-Punk, Underground, New York, 1976 to 1980. And I'm delighted to introduce the book's authors, uh, Thurston Moore and Byron Coley. And Thurston, as you all know, is a singer, songwriter, and guitarist of the band Sonic Youth. He played on the soundtrack of several movies, including Backfree, Velvet Goldmine, Heavy, and Manic. In addition, he runs Ecstatic Peace Records. And Byron Coley is a music critic who wrote predominantly for Forced Exposure, and his work has also appeared in New York Rocker, Boston Rock, and Take It Magazine. And he was a contributing writer to Spin in the 1990s, and he currently writes, along with Thurston, for Wire and Arthur Magazine. And he also runs Ecstatic Yacht, a record label and shop based in Massachusetts. So you, won't you please join me in welcoming Thurston Moore and Byron Cole. Thank you. Are you going to play that, uh, are you going to do that after, you think? Yeah, I have a video here that uh, the artist Erica Beckman had made in 1970, um, I think 77 or 78. 79. 79. That um, she had uh, some bands <clears throat> come over to her loft space in, in 79 in, in, uh, on Grand Street. And I think she was um, asked by a, a, a gallery or a museum in Europe to sort of film some downtown bands uh, at, at that year. Uh, to show at some at some uh, exposition, and uh, it was kind of a, a film that none of us knew about. And after this, uh, the No Way book came out. It was kind of um, a few doors were started opening. Some of the photographers that we were kind of uh, looking for, kind of um, we found out where they were. But it was after the, the book was published. Um, you know, we sort of uh, saw photos that we would have loved to have published in this book that um, uh, afterwards and. Um, but one thing uh, was that we, all of a sudden, this uh, woman, Erica, um, said she had this, this film, and she sort of dug it up, and uh, she had um, Lee Ronaldo and Aaron Mullen sort of do uh, sort of sound uh, um, kind of reparation on it to some degree. And it's a pretty cool film. I, I, won't, I don't want to show it all to you because it's about 30 minutes long, but um, it has... Uh, theoretical Girls, which is which Glenn Bronca's uh, first group in New York, uh, like in uh, the No Wave days, uh, between uh, 76 and 81, and, and also The Static, which was his group that he was doing, sort of concurrently at some point, uh, certainly at the, uh, the latter days of uh, Theoretical Girls, which was him and um, Barbara S. and Christine Hahn. It has Ut, which was like an all-girl uh, band um, when they were a, a, an original four-piece. Um, and what else is on there? There's uh, Reese Chatham is on there playing um, with uh, Wharton Tears, uh, just a guitar drum thing, and he's sort of doing his initial sort of development of one of his sort of uh, guitar, trio. guitar trio pieces, or yeah. And um, I mean, do you, should we just talk and then you can show that after? Yeah, I'll show it afterwards. Right. <laughs> I don't care when I show it. I mean, yeah, you know. It is good, though. You haven't, but, you know, well, Byron hasn't seen it yet. I haven't even seen it. <laughs> but, you know, I hear it's really good. <laughs> the thing is, when we started looking for stuff, it was a lot of, uh, uh, you know, we'd been, we'd been talking about doing something for, you know, off and on for quite a while. But, uh, you know, the, the idea was to do something that was a little bit different than... Uh, and some of the stuff we've been hearing about and, and, and seeing about in terms of stuff, didn't, it seemed like people kept on turning up the same photographs, the same stories, kind of all the, all the same material kept on getting recycled and, and, and fiddled around with in different, different kind of formats. And uh, we knew that there was a lot more stuff out there. And uh, so, you know, at, at a certain point when, uh, when uh, Tamar uh, told us we could uh, do the project, um, you know, there was just, there were a lot of people to talk to, and it was surprising to me in a way how many people hadn't died. <laughs> you know, there really weren't, yeah. you know, there were a lot of people uh, uh, from that particular scene lived kind of rugged lives in one way or another, but the, uh, the attrition rate was actually pretty small. And uh, so there were a lot of people who were around, and uh, a lot of them sort of said like, yeah, you know, I'll talk about this one time. <laughs> 
and that's it. I never, you know, it's like 30 years ago, man. I don't want to like talk about no wave anymore after this. But, uh, but we managed to get to a lot of people, you know, we transcribed like, 300,000 words of interview stuff. I think of which, what do we, we only used, you know, 30 or I don't know, man. something, you know, not that much in the book, but it was like, it was pretty insane uh, sort of talking to everybody from that, uh, from that period. Some people I'd known, some people I hadn't really known very well, and, uh, you know, digging up a lot of photographs and flyers and uh, all that material was, uh, was pretty interesting. It was like, uh, it was sort of an exercise in kind of anti-nostalgia in a way, because there was... The only thing that anybody that I really, you know, that we talked to, that anybody was nostalgic for at all was just like rent prices, you know? It was like, nobody really wanted to get in a way back machine and go back at all, because New York was really kind of a screwed up place right then. But everybody would be like, oh man, you know, I played, I paid $110 for that apartment. And, uh, you know, that was a common thread. That, uh, you know, rents were really good on the Lower East Side in 1978. But, uh, but you know, the, the no wave scene was kind of, it was a product of a, of a weird transitional period in New York. I mean, New York had been really broke, really kind of bankrupt, you know, before that. And, and uh, it was kind of on the skids. People had really written it off. And, you know, people who came, who still wanted to come from different places to do art there, they, were, they felt like you were walking into the neighborhoods you could live in, you really felt like you were walking into, you know, danger town, in a way. I mean, you lived on the Lower East. Yeah, I lived on uh, 13th Street between A and B. I moved there in, in early 77. And I started, I was looking for a place in in uh, 76, but I, I couldn't really figure out how to do it. And there was these, uh, there was these guys who moved to New York who uh, came out of Rhode Island School of Design, which is... They were sort of the next class after David Byrne and his cronies, and uh, I had met one of them at a Colors record store in New Haven, Connecticut, which is where I would go to buy records, and I was sort of, I had sort of seen images of, of pop rock bands, and I knew that their records were somewhere, and I found out through, somehow I found out that they were at either of these record stores in Manhattan, one of them was called Golden Oldies, or it was called Bleaker Bob's at that point, and there's other, other places on um, uh, West, Fourth Street uh, record place. What was that place? Oh, West Tenth Street. Tenth Street. Tenth Street. This was what's it? Disco file. Disco file. On Eighth Street. And um, it, you know, but New York from where I lived was like a solid hour and a half away, and I could get to New Haven like within like forty minutes. And uh, I had found out this this place, Cutler's. Um, I read an interview with Lenny K where he said one of his favorite record stores was Cutler's in New Haven. So I sort of like went there looking for it. And I found it, and they had. Um, they had the first Ramones album like the day it came out. And I remember like getting that record and thinking that it was kind of like, you sort of had heard the term punk rock a little bit, but um, it, it, it wasn't really that widely known. And in a way the Ramones record, um, even like the Patti Smith record that sort of uh, predated it by a, a little bit of time, it sort of seemed like more an extension of what was going on with like glam rock or glitter rock at the time, because it, it did sort of have this kind of high concept of the way it sort of presented itself. And uh, you know, Patty with like the maple floor photo on, on the cover, and the Ramones with their, you know, they sort of had a, they had a very sort of um, kind of very studied and distinct image, you know, that they were putting across. And so it was kind of fascinating, more sort of as this kind of thing coming out of glitter or glam in a way. But it. it the whole sort of uh, punk identity um, came in pretty quickly. So I think moving to New York in like, uh, you know, 76, 77 and playing music, I, played, I started playing music with the guy, uh, uh, this guy I met at Cutler's who, uh, who was looking through a, a Velvet, the Velvet Underground bin, which was like, there was nothing there. <laughs> and there was just like a placard that said Velvet Underground and there was never anything in it. And, but you would go to the record store and you'd sort of look through all these kind of like, uh, you know, cruddy 70s records and then you know there would be this Velvet Underground band which was really sort of exotic for somebody like me or something this other guy and we and we both were reaching our hands into it to see if there's any records in there and uh we kind of looked at each other and, and uh I was like oh man you know it looks like you're never gonna get any Velvet Underground records here <laughs> he's like yeah he goes like oh man have you ever been to CBGB and I was like no have you and he's like 
Well, not yet, but you know, I, I, you know, I plan on going. And uh, have you read Punk Magazine? I was like, no, I, I heard about it. And you know, within two weeks, all this stuff had started happening, and we kind of uh, connected. And I, and him and his buddies moved to New York, and I started driving my Volkswagen and playing with these guys. And this is the same time period that uh, people like, you know, Lydia Lunch and James Chance and, and, and Ardo Lindsay and uh, I think were coming to New York. Although Ardo, I guess, obviously came in a little earlier. earlier. As, uh, I guess Lydia also came in earlier too, to some degree. But um, it was definitely sort of wanting to sort of be part of what we were finding out about um, the New York band scene. Um, but the idea of starting, to, I, the idea of being in a rock and roll band was kind of like a little far fetched because nobody, nobody really knew how to play. And if you didn't know how to play, you just sort of played in like kind of like more of a traditional rock and roll band. So, um, and bands like um, like Suicide were really kind of interesting because they weren't really sort of playing anything that was part of traditional rock and roll, and they were kind of the galvanizing band uh, for kids like us, and um, plus they were really sort of completely uh, exciting and, and deranged on stage. And, yeah, especially uh, at Max's. Max's had a really good setup. Where the, uh, the way the, the, the Max's front, or the, the, the upstairs room where the stage was, was set up, the, the tables all ran perpendicular to the stage, and they, they, went, they were long, and they would run all the way out from the stage for about 20 feet or something like that. And people would sit along them, just like in rows. You'd sit with a lot of people you didn't know. And Alan Vega would walk out like onto those tables and just like kick drinks all over and like yeah. you know, pour stuff in people's heads and stuff like that. So it was a real like super, like a, a really good setup for confrontational stuff. Like CBGB's was not, CBGB's had those little tables up front, yeah. but you couldn't really walk onto them quite the same way. And Vega was just like, he was really impressive in his way of just like goading audiences into trying to do something. And you know, that's like, when you talk, one common thread of almost all these bands, uh, the no wave bands, you know, was that everybody, the only band they could really agree on liking was everybody was really into suicide. And uh, part of it was that just Alan's, you know, Marty's musical stuff was what it was, but Alan's just like, you know, presence was so extreme, and he was so weird, and so obviously kind of off his rocker in a way, that it was, a, it was so theatrical that it really sort of made everything else seem like it was possible to people like Lydia and to James Chance and to some other people like that. Um, and so, Suicide was so minimal musically. It was, you know, one guy with a keyboard, and then another guy just with a microphone. Um, and, you know, it sort of set up a model where, especially after Mars came along and, uh, you know, they were a band that really utilized, like, slide guitar in a way that was, like, almost not tuned, almost didn't really know how to play it in a way. Um, you know, Connie had a, had a very original sound, the way that she played, but it wasn't any kind of standard rock thing at all, just as Sumner's wasn't really either. I mean, the only person in that band who'd ever played was the was really the bass player. Um, you know, the drummer was a sculptor, the, you know, one guitarist was a dancer, the other guitarist was really a, a visual artist and a piano player. And uh, they just had a really, like, loose, weird kind of sound that wasn't really like much of anything else. Well, nobody, none of those bands were playing rock and roll, because nobody could, knew how to play rock and roll. And, and, but they knew what the they knew what the energy of rock and roll was, and they knew it through a band like Suicide, and they certainly knew it through a band like the Dead Boys, and they knew it through the Ramones as well, and um, you know, and the Cramps, who were kind of new in town, who played like a really sort of this this kind of destroyed minimalist take on garage underground <coughs> records that nobody had anyway except for them, you know, and uh, so there was it was there was all these kind of those those kind of influences were 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 there, but. You know, James Chancellor had this kind of, um, he was bringing sort of uh, free jazz information into into it, which was, you know, another whole wild game unto itself. But, you know, nobody really knew how to play, and they certainly weren't going to play rock and roll. And there's this whole thing of punk rock sort of setting itself up as a, you know, as a dis destroyer of rock and roll tradition. But it set itself apart from traditional rock and roll, but it was still sort of utilizing, um, 
you know, the, the tendencies of rock and roll, you know, bar chord rock, and Patti Smith was basically a rock and roll band, you know, um, albeit one with like a, you know, a, 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 a very uh, a, a interesting, um, you know, poet, you know, on the microphone, and, you know, Blondie was really coming out of sort of like somebody who had sort of history with avant-garde theater, and, and there was a lot of tie-in with like historical New York lineage, you know, be it sort of Warhol's sort of multimedia world of like where artists and writers and musicians all sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, commingled. And it was definitely an extension of that, but, you know, these, these musicians, these people like, who are really sort of these kind of weirdo alien teens who came to New York to sort of, you know, survive on the streets in any which way they can just to sort of do what they wanted to do which was kind of you know what was resonating with this, this kind of punk rock scene um sort of set itself apart because they 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 none of them played any semblance of real rock and roll and and each band was really distinct and different from each other i mean teenage jesus and the jerks um was ultimately a, a trio, and it was Lydia Lunch playing sort of like over amp slide guitar, um, and a, and a bass player and a drummer, which she sort of instructed to play sort of just this kind of martial blat, you know, behind her while she while she uh, uh, intonated these you know these 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 kind of headline lyrics, you know, about her own sort of personal demons, and and um, it was not it was not uh, fun music like Blondie, or it wasn't sort of like you know. Um, you know, a call to like, you know, spiritual uplifting uh, a la Patti Smith. In and fact, I mean, Lydia's stuff was almost directly in, in opposition to Patti Smith. Yes. Yeah, which was really interesting at the time because, you know, the whole, uh, that whole first generation of, of CBGB Max's bands was all about sort of going, you know, just destroying Led Zeppelin and Emerson, Lake and Palmer. And yes, and you, threw those, you threw those records away immediately if you, if you sort of, um, got turned on to this, which is what we all did. And uh, all of a sudden, sort of concurrently was, you know, these 18 year olds like Lydia and, and James saying like, you know, uh, Patti Smith is just, you know, a barefoot hippie poet. We, you know, we're, I'm here to destroy her. And, and uh, we don't have time for the television's, you know, uh, endless wanky guitar solos. And, and you know, and, but their music was like, it was so, um, it was, it was, it was really sort of nutso in a way. And, and, you know, I'm not really quite sure that I, I actually kind of, um, I liked it. I liked it when I would see it. And I sort of, sort of, I sort of would see it by happenstance. Not too many people were going to these gigs to see these bands anyway. I mean, they were very sort of secondary, if not tertiary on, on the circuit. And there was a lot of bands around doing stuff, but these, these bands were just sort of, I mean, it was hard to find anybody who would say like those bands were really great, you know, at the time because they were, you know, unless they were very friendly with them or, or you were just really sort of um, of the mind to sort of like like it something. Was a, like that. It was a, it was an extremely small, extremely incestuous scene, um, you know, at the time what was going on. It had a tendency to really, uh, you know, especially if the bands were playing with each other. They really people, you know, the crowds were really small. It was mostly. You know, weeknight stuff, or people would do the Sunday night. Uh, you know, uh, when Terry York did the Sunday night bookings at Max's for a while. Um, you know, Lydia had a sort of a regular gig there with other people, and they would, uh, you know, show uh, Scott and Beth B films that they'd do in serial form. And uh, but, you know, it was kind of it was polarizing in a way because you would, you would yeah. go see these bands. It was really hard to sort of put them in context with anything except for punk rock, and punk rock was all, already sort of this radical music, but this. I mean, this was like, there's a, there's a, in the book we interview um, uh, Andy Schwartz of the, of the New York Rocker, and he's taken to a Beirut slump gig, which was Lydia's band that was sort of concurrent with Teenage Jesus for a little bit. And, you know, his whole take on it was like, it, it was the most impenetrable, insufferable music he had ever heard. He just could not deal with it at all. And he, uh, but he said like, you know, on his way back to his apartment, he's, he just kept thinking like, that was terrible. but. There's something about it, the fact that they were they weren't doing it uh, to sort of you know take the piss of the audience or anything like that. It was like they were doing it because they, it was something that they actually really wanted to present as 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 a as a musical artistic statement. So he knew there was some validity there, and he just sort of had to figure out like 
figure out how to sort of process that as, as a rock writer. And right. so, you know, a lot of the music was really kind of, it was, it was irritating. Sur on the surface, it was extremely irritating. Um, you know, the, the, there were really harsh, a lot of really discordant sounds in it, like really kind of weird lopsided rhythms. Um, you know, it, it's hard to, it's hard to even get across, some of the recordings don't really get across just how, how really harsh the, the guitar settings were on some of that stuff. Um, yeah, but the, re the recordings are what kind of swayed a lot of people. As soon as like records were made, and so, I mean, you can sort of owe it to the, kind of, to the, the uh, mad genius of, of um, Charles Ball, who had a label called Lust on Lust, and he, you know, through uh, the influence of Robert Quine, who was a guitar player in Richard Hell's band, who um, really sort of liked what Liddy was doing, you know, with the guitar, and he, he, um, he, you know, he recorded the first Teenage Jesus stuff, and, you know, I remember buying that first Teenage Jesus single just because I was really curious about this band to some degree. I mean, their name was just like so wrong, and you know, the interviews were so acerbic that the, the few interviews that existed in like the Soho Weekly News or the Voice, Village Voice, and. Uh, you know, I remember buying the, the seven inch because I, I read such a bad review of it uh, by Ed Naha, where he just sort of said, this sounds like, um, you know, cats being murdered, you know? And, it, and I was like, wow, you know, I really, I'm very, I, I want to hear what that sounds like. And, and it didn't quite sound like that, but I thought, it, I thought uh, as, a, as a record of like, of a band, I just thought it sounded like nothing I had heard up to that point, and I and then I sort of considered myself to have have heard quite a a bit uh, in you know as far as like rock and roll was concerned, and so that was that was really shocking and really sort of exciting, and I really wanted to go see them after I had heard that record, you know, but they they kind of broke up yeah, really quickly. I mean, you know, the bands really the bands didn't really play very often. Most of them they didn't play. In any places that you would necessarily go to, either. I mean, it was like and the money thing is like I would, if, you know, paying three dollars to go see a band was kind of a lot of money. And you know, and Hilly at CBGBs was starting to charge four dollars for like Ramones and Patti Smith gigs, and so it was getting a little out of hand. And uh, so, if you were going to go see a band and spend money to see a band, uh, like three or four bucks, you would, you would sort of, you would go see the Ramones at like Hurrahs or something like that, something that was, you know, you knew was going to be you know, totally happening. And it, always, and it was totally happening, but to go see a band that sort of you'd see like in your neighborhood, some of your age, it was, you know, getting some, you know, they weren't going to see my band that I was playing in, so I wish I go see them, it was this kind of thing. But they obviously had some kind of connection with each other, which was really kind of interesting, and they kind of looked really uh, totally amazing, and, and they were, and, uh, their attitude was, it was they, so... They were sort of off-putting also, though. I mean, there was really kind of a fashion thing going on with a lot of those bands that... I mean, they kind of dressed well and stuff. Like, even though it was like sort of thrift store clothes, it was like, you know, James Chance, every time you'd see him, he'd be wearing like a sport jacket. And yeah. Stuff. And like Lydia would always have like, you know, like some weird dress on with like, you know, and sort of like heels and all this stuff like that. Yeah. And, you know, for me and my friends, we were like, you know, I mean, we just, we just dressed like bums like we do. And, uh, you know, I mean, it was like, wow, you know, these, these people are all kind of dude up. That was a little weird also. I mean, it was funny going through the pictures in this book, because I mean, everybody looks like such babies. But, you know, at the time, yeah. I can remember thinking, like, oh, these people really look sophisticated. <laughs> and, and that was kind of a, it was a weird, off-putting thing at that time, when everybody else was sort of, like, dressing down, like, you know, you know ripped up clothes and stuff like that. You didn't go to Canel Jeans and get like the skinny lapel $3 jacket and the... No, or like the, go to the at Macy's Action Shop. <laughs> no, no, that wasn't really on my schedule. But, uh, you know, and the thing was though, it really, the, the whole scene came and went, the real core of the scene came and went really pretty fast. And by the time it got really named and it really got codified to any extent, it was done. I mean, it really was, it existed as a scene, really, like a coherent scene, almost historically, exclusively. By the time the No New York album came out, um, you know, those bands were almost all completely gone. By the time the Mars, Mars is like 12 yeah. came out, Mars only played one gig after that. 
by the time the Contortions album finally came out, really the original Contortions were pretty much done. Yeah, the, initial, the initial conceptual sound of, of, of each of these artists was almost sort of, um, sort of fully born in a way. And it, it was like, it, almost like it, it, it couldn't develop, it could only implode, and it did. And the fact that it was so non-traditional non rock, uh, it was, was interesting because almost everybody sort of went into like a next phase of their, of their music life. And um, it was kind of embracing sort of like more of Learning a, how to play. Learning how to play yeah. sort of rock music. So, you know, Lydia sort of all of a sudden um, shows up with a band called Eight-Eyed Spy, which was, you know, kind of amazing because <clears throat> It was Lydia in a in a band doing like Diddy Wah Diddy and Cre and like Creedence Clear, you know, Run Through the Jungle and, and uh, other covers and Maintaining My Cool by the Sonics, you know, and then some, and a lot of originals. And it was musicians from uh, like George Scott, who was you know from the Contortions, and and Pat Irwin and, and, and Squibunos was on drums. But you know, the word got out that Lydia had a new band, and it was like a rock band, which just did not make any sense. Like, it, it was almost like, you know, this has got to be sort of like one of Lydia's, you know, jokes. Cruel joke. Yeah, cruel joke. And when they debuted, and they played like those first nights uh, at like, at uh, Tier 3, which was like a club downtown that was open for about a year at the most. Um, it was fantastic, you know, it was like this really sort of just um, really hectic, off-kilter sort of rock and roll band with like Lydia just sort of hanging on the microphone you know, singing, like bleating out these, uh, these these cover songs, but it really kind of worked, and it was like really exciting, and people just started kind of dancing to it, which was, it was unreal that this was happening at a Lydia lunch gig. Um, Guys, uh, can you take some questions? Yeah, we'll take some questions, yeah. But I was just basically, I guess the point I was gonna make to, uh, to uh, wrap, up, wrap up is that as soon as any of these mus musicians started playing any semblance of Rock and roll, no wave was over, you know, for all intents and purposes. Questions? <laughs> yes, sir. So did Brian Eno really destroy the scene? <laughs> Brian Eno did not really destroy the scene. And Brian Eno came in to um, to uh, master like the Talking Heads record at that time, whatever record that might have been. And uh, he, uh, he was sort of um, friendly with some of the downtown art types like Diego Cortez and Anya Phillips who were kind of, who were a big part of the CBGB kind of scene of the first wave. And, and uh, you know, Anya was very close to Debbie Harry and Diego as well. And they sort of were part of that scene. And they had sort of taken off and come back and they were like, oh, you know, the Ramones and Blondie are still sort of doing their thing. And, but there's these new bands that are just like really Kind of like crazy in the in you know on the underground that that sort of had some connections to uh, some of the art world to some degree and they started seeing these bands and saw how kind of great they were and you know Arno Lindsay put on this um, this kind of watermark event of uh, a benefit for a a magazine called X Motion Picture Magazine and he had invited some of these bands to play and so you know theoretical girls and and uh, DNA contortions uh, and Arsenal, I think, and a few other bands played at this uh, this gig on 4th Street at this theater, and like, they figured like maybe, you know, like 50 people would show up and see these bands, and they'd make a little money. About 500 people showed up, and it was like this amazing thing. It's like everybody downtown below 14th Street at that point in 1970, what was that, like 78, early 78? Like everybody showed up at this thing. And it was like right when James really started like heading out to the audience and, and kind of like, you know, trying to smack people down and then run away from them. And, and uh, that's where he met Anya Phillips, who was, you know, became, you know, which this relationship was certainly uh, sort of kind of was a dynamic in the scene. But, um, but you know, you know, just, I mean, he sort of, there were, a, I mean, there were a lot of different stories brunted around about, you know, people being asked to be on the record and not being on the record. And it kind of boiled down to the fact that, you know, Eno basically said, yeah, you know, he got in touch with a few people to see what they wanted to do. Everybody rehearsed in uh, Delancey Street Loft that Lydia had right then. Lydia and Bradley Field lived there. 
and, and Teenage Jesus rehearsed there, DNA rehearsed there, the Contortions rehearsed there, and Mars rehearsed there right then. And that's what really ended up being the four bands that were on it. There was an original proposal to have more bands on with less, with, you know, just doing one or two songs a piece. And there are a lot of people who have said that they were cut off at, for political reasons. But I've got to say that having listened to some of their stories and talked to some of the other people who were involved, it seems really unlikely to me. It's just something that happened really fast. Eno showed up and he was in town. He lived in, it was the beginning of the period where he lived in New York for an extended period of time for a few years. He just saw the scene. He'd gone to a couple other things. Jeffrey Lone had a series of shows at his loft, the guy from the Theoretical Girls. He saw some of this stuff and said, these bands aren't going to last very long. It would be great to get the document done. Somehow he talked Chris Blackwell into like putting up some money for it. It was a really minimal amount of money to just do super bare bones recording, which in retrospect a lot of people complained about. But, you know, he didn't have any, really what the he, Frank Eno didn't have any agenda of any of you know, being exclusionary, let's put it that way. Nah. He just, you know, it was just some bands were around, they just threw down some tracks really fast. And, uh, you know, he didn't really do much more than that. But, you know, as Lydia said, it's like, um, uh, you know, Robert Quine should have produced, produced that record, which would have been great, because Quine cert certainly had sort of the, the, the aesthetic down as far as like what was going on with these bands. And, well, he didn't wreck it. He didn't wreck the scene. The scene wrecked itself. I mean, there's a lot of sort of little, like, there's some jealousy, there's some geographical sort of like, uh, kind of uh, envy between like the people who sort of resided in the Soho district and people who resided in the East Village district in a way. And there's people who crossed over both of those things, certainly, you know, be it the Rudolph Grazer who crossed over. And Joe Scalvino has played in bands from both sides of the, of the margin. But, but, you know, there were a lot of like, there were a lot of like alpha sort of personalities involved there too, with a lot of like whack, really kind of people who were a little bit whack up. And it was, you know, none of those bands were the last of Anybody else? A question? Uh, I sort of do. <laughs> sure, sort of do. <laughs> well, in a book, you focus a lot on um, Max's and CBGB's, but like when I got to Manhattan, say 78, 79, mostly, then I got exposed to No Wave, like at the Mud Club and Tier 3 and Squat Theater. And do you want to talk a little bit? The Mud Club and Tier 3, I mean, at that point, that's when the like, Bush Tetras and Eight Eyed Spy and Ray Beats and those kind of bands that came after where they actually did start playing more sort of yeah, you know, like, the, like the know, later version of DNA teams. with, you know, and Dark Day. And I mean, DNA went on in, at least in 83, right. maybe, yeah. you know, before they kind of stopped. And they were true to their, you know, they never really sort of changed the, their game at all as far as like becoming any, any kind of like raucous kind of thing. So would you say that was more of a second wave of No Way? A bit, yeah. I mean, those were definitely, I mean, all those bands, I mean, even, DNA with Tim Wright was a real different band than it had been when Robin Crutchfield was in the band. Robin played these sort of like weird, minimal, kind of doomy sort of keyboard, right. like big clumps of keyboard sound. And you know, Tim was just, you know, he would do that like stalking across stage in his like yeah. stocking feet, you know, smoking a cigarette and playing bass. And it was just really, it was really different. It was more, it was more of a rock thing to me. I mean at the I mean at the time I would not have you know made that distinction necessarily. Yeah. But in retrospect And in seventy eight, you know, Glenn Bronco was just I mean he, he had stopped doing theoretical girls with, with and, and the static was still kind of ongoing his trio. But he was basically focusing on doing what he ended up doing for the rest of his career, which was sort of develop the sort of mass guitar kind of you know, orchestrations and such. And Reese Chatham too had moved from doing, you know, like the gynecologist type stuff and even from uh, Arsenal then, you know, into doing more composed stuff. There were a lot of those guys that they're really, they were, it was a, it was a, it was a brief phase of their, of stuff that they did and it was kind of, I, I don't think a lot of them, uh, you know, just moved on to something else. And a lot of it was more, you know, some more ostensibly musical in a way that I think some of the No Wave stuff was, was less uh, uh, musical in a kind of standard. But everybody, for the most part, everybody continued to develop what they wanted, I mean, in their own sort of, you know, right. uh, idiosyncratic way. They developed their, their, their art, you know, and the fact that, that those 
the beginning uh, for, for all of them was like this no wave thing. And that's kind of what we really wanted to capture. We, you know, it's, and we drew real sort of, um, you know, real, we drew really sort of hard lines, real sort of strict parameters about like what that was and, you know, it ends, you know, it, we, we find a real end point to it. Okay, we have time for maybe one or two questions. Do you want to see the video? Do we have time for that? Um, What's, what is it? Is there a curfew? Well, um, do you want to turn it around? I was, I was going to watch it and sort of explain it to you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it in a while. Now, let's see. I mean, is this going to be, is this kind of, will this work? <laughs> this will work. <laughs> I'll just show you a little bit of it because you get it. I mean, that, one thing that we would love to have done everybody, is... Everybody has to come closer. <laughs> you can gather around. And one thing I would have loved to have done is um, had a, a DVD that would have come with this book, which, would, of course, its list price would have gone skyrocketing. But um, these bands were great live bands. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, one of the things we had a lot of passion about wanting to write about this is like how how memorable they were as, as live bands. And um, let me go around here. Did you see yourself making a companion film to this book at any point? <coughs> like, a, like, a, like a fictionalized film? Like, like a, like a, like a documentary. <laughs> with like Blake Lively as a uh, <laughs> place. <laughs> yeah, like a document. Yes, we do, actually. <laughs> How do you run this baby? Here we go. Yeah, they put the microphone right on this thing. <laughs> All right, so I'll play you. Uh, you want to see the fire? No, no, it's around. Right. I'll see it later. Let's see. Come on. I'm not going to show it unless you come around. <laughs> So this is how we uh, this is how we work together. All right, Hi. just write a little more. <laughs> <coughs> hey, they misspelled puzzle. Yeah, I know that. Is this working? Our theoretical girls. <laughs>
just says a little bit. There's a lot more. But we have a presidential debate to go watch. Who shot that? Who shot it? This, uh, this woman, Erica Beckman. Super 8? I believe so. Super 8, yeah. So, and the thing is, there's, there's, there's a lot of actual live sort of uh, footage that, I mean, none of it exists on YouTube, and a little bit on YouTube. You see, you see like the Target video of Teenage Jesus. Pat, Pat, and, Pat Ivers and Emily Armstrong are going to, their film's going to come Emily out next year. Well, supposedly they have like a film, but their film is, I mean, it covers a lot of different ground. And, you know, we basically, what we'd like to do is just really sort of cherry pick all the No Wave stuff out of everybody's archives and put together like a, a collection of dust. But it's, you know, it's a little difficult. I mean, a lot of these people who sort of have all this footage, I mean, it's, it's kind of proprietary for them. So it's, it's a little they, difficult. They have this one show where they did the show at the Paradise Garage where they had yeah. James Chance and all those people, but the sound is awful on it, but it's spectacular. Yes, it's, it's amazing looking. Yeah. <laughs> I think there's some early chat on yeah, there's some stuff on YouTube, but there's a lot that's not. And there's there's some recordings. There's a lot of you know Dan Graham, uh, the artist who actually produced the first Static Seven Inch. Um, he, you know, he's got a shoebox full of live cassettes that are shoddily recorded to some degree, but some of it is not. Some of it's great, and other people have like live recordings. But some stuff's coming out. There's like a small label up in Maine that's actually. Yeah, putting out some the, stuff. The guy who done the sound for like the artist space shows and stuff like that, and he had he had tapes of everything from uh, it. So. Paul Schinkel, did he shoot? Well, Schinkel might have had some stuff, but you know, it, I mean, it's, as archivists, I mean, we're always sort of want to sort of put everything together in like a really sort of you know kind of complete specific package, but it doesn't really sort of seem to be the way it's going to go. I mean, you know, I'm certainly Pat Ivers and Emily Armstrong releasing a film that sort of has all this other stuff in it because they're going to have like contortions. But they're gonna have like next. It's gonna be next to Kid Creole and the coconuts. You know? No, I don't think so. And then it's gonna go to the Dead not, Boys. Not, no, I've seen their stuff. I know. I know what it is. Then you have Kid Creole in there somehow. I, just I think they have a little Kid Creole. I'll just start now. Tuxedo Moon. And, no, it's gonna have know. Divine with the Dead Boys. Yeah. Else I'd rather sort of just have this this repertoire <laughs> like gentleman right here for a while. <laughs> But like this woman was saying, you can make a documentary out of it, right? A documentary on No Wave is something that we actually sort of thought about at some point, even before getting, going into doing a book, because it is so visual. And there is a lot of visual documentation. And to and a lot of people are still alive. And it would, you know, you could actually do a documentary. But we, you know, we didn't really have the wherewithal to do it. We certainly didn't have the coin to do that. And to find somebody to sort of pony up the capital for us to do that was just kind of like... Yeah, we have a lot of other shit going on. Well, the, book but, is, the book is like a doctor. But the book kind of worked out. And you know, we like books anyway. We're kind of book people, you know. So, um, and the, and Abrams was was uh, very forthcoming in letting us sort of have uh, open, kind of an open uh, hand with this stuff. Our next book is going to be even more there, crazy. Are there any more questions? That, from Whatever happened. Asked, let me just see if anybody. Has I haven't really asked the question. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Whatever happened the to the section back uh, there? <laughs> whatever happened to the people you started out with, like the Rhode Island, the Connecticut people, and also what happened to um, Nancy Arlen? Nancy Arlen, who was the drummer in Mars, who's a very sort of a, a critical and significant uh, figure in the No Wave history. Um, she, you know, she was a and she was a visual artist living downtown and um, doing dance as well sort of performance so. stuff. And she's the one who sort of connected with Connie Bird when Connie Bird came up with Ardo and Mark Cunningham and uh, Mariel Cervenka and, and, um, to, from Eckerd College in Florida and, she, and wanted to sort of do something, play music, you know. And they, she, uh, Nancy Arlen died maybe four years ago? Less than that, I think two, two years two ago. Years she ago. got on the operating table, she went. Yeah. What? She went in for a heart, uh, uh, some kind of a hot heart operation that really was supposed to be not too, you know, nothing really too crazy, but it just it went wrong. Yeah. So yeah, she's yeah. The the the, the uh, few people died. George Scott died fairly early on, which was really kind of a, a, a real a tragic thing because he was real central to yeah. a Gordon lot of Stevenson people. Stevenson died pretty early. Gordon Stevenson was an early AIDS death in New York. Uh, Muriel Cervenka died. Muriel Cervenka who was. Uh, Part of that scene, she was Exine's older sister, and she was the manager of Teenage Jesus and the Jerks. Um, and she died in a car accident in like 80, 79. Yeah, she was in an early version of DNA, also. Yeah. 
How about the people you started out with? The people I started out with? Connecticut and Rhode Island you were mentioning earlier. Gee. First band that you were in when you moved. The, I was in a band called The Coachman. They 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 uh they've all gone they were like graphic art artists. I mean one of them was a comics artist who of note, um uh, J D King, um who, you know, he's done stuff like it's in like like weirdo and like crump art crump publication stuff. And, yeah, that's sort of his world, it's comics art. You guys got a lot of questions. Yeah. Well, I just want to talk. What do you think the what what the influence of, of, of No Wave was after that? Do you think it influenced hip hop, the deconstructionism? Did it influence hip hop? I don't. You know, it's funny because um, hip hop is sort of like a radical street music that's really indigenous to New York. Was really concurrent with what was going on at, on the uh, downtown scene of like CBGBs and Maxes. And I got in a way, I think the awareness of hip hop was more. Uh, to the CBGB's Maxis scene as opposed to hip hop artists being aware of punk rock or having punk rock influence them thus, you know, in a way. There was different sort of aesthetics at work, um, you know, I mean, hip hop always sort of had this ambition towards um, kind of, uh, hip hop had a more ambitions towards a, a certain uh, modicum of success that was based on a certain standard of success, which was, you know, um, money and, and and I think in the no wave punk rock scene that was kind of looked upon as like kind of not cool. Certainly the later punk rock scenes it was just like that kind of success was kind of bogus. And it was it, it had something because it, it was too uh, associated with you know But the deconstructionism of the of, of the music, you know Yeah those 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 aesthetics of deconstructionism were definitely sort of uh, that was kind of a, that was definitely a shared I think it was environmental, you know, New York sort of was in a deconstructed state at that point. So I think sort of the environment of New York City at that time, which was so, so hardcore, um, had a lot to do with how this music was actually sort of kind of being emoted, um, both in the hip hop scene and, and the uh, sort of like the underground punk rock scene. So it was, it was definitely a, a connection there. And it became more of a connection, certainly, with uh, clubs like The Mud Club and Tier 3, um, you know, where, where it was, uh, where hip hop sort of became um, really sort of like a very sort of critical sort of uh, part of the language. You know, even in the art scene downtown, like the you know the kitchen center would sort of. I remember working at the kitchen center when I was young, when I was younger, and uh, we you know bringing down like break dancers from uh, the South Bronx when that when we first started sort of hearing about that kind of stuff, and you would bring them down and put them in this situation that they would do like a total like break dance kind of afternoon in front of like, you know, artists. It's kind of, it was kind of ridiculous, you know, in a way, but it was kind of cool. I mean, it was nobody, you know, it was just, but you know, the hip hop people up in the South Bronx weren't like bringing up, uh, you know, Soho artists to sort of do lectures. <laughs> so they, they, they didn't really work with them. Any more questions? And then we're going to do the signing, and then you guys can ask questions. Did anybody see House Bunny yet? <laughs> I strongly recommend staying very far away from that film. <laughs> it's po quite possibly the worst film I've ever seen. And I've seen a lot of bad movies. How did you end up seeing yeah. House Bunny? What is it? Well, because there was not much, I mean, it just had a good name. <laughs> And I like Aunt, I thought Aunt, Anna Ferris was going to pull it off, but it was a total. She's her. She should really fire her agent. You know, and rumor rumor Willis is in it, which is you know, it's like speaks for itself. Speaks for itself. <laughs> for any rumor files. What about putting together a no wave music festival and reuniting all these bands? Well, Teenage Jesus uh, did a one time only. Uh, Reignition at, at the uh, book release event that we had at the KS Art Gallery on, on Leonard Street across the Knitting Factory, and that was amazing. That was great. We had a good time. We rehearsed for a week, and, and I I I, I uh, um, got to play uh, bass because Bradley Field, the drummer, is dead, but Jim Scalino was the bass player and knew how to play the drama, and uh, so he went to play drums. And they had me play bass. And, it was a blast. We're going to do it once more in the UK in December. I think that's it. We'll put it to sleep. Reading is, you know, they're not good. The thing is, you just don't break up. That's my... Uh... 
go on hiatus. Yeah. I mean, unless you, I mean, you can't break up. If you break up, it's kind of cool because you give yourself about five to ten years and get back together, and that's when you, that's when you get real revenue. So I, never, I was never able to experience that. To go out. Let's sign some books. That's like, I think that's really the next the next move. Where is the Before book? Carrie falls asleep again. <laughs> is Byron? Byron took off. He had to go home. <laughs> Hey, he's right behind you. Look out. <laughs> well, you guys have been a terrific audience. So now we get to sign the books. And we have the books at the table to my right, if you're interested. Yeah, we'll sign any book you have, actually. <laughs> That's right. Um, please, here's a lady in the back. We'll take What's your names this? if you want them personalized. Oh, thanks. And you can pay for your book at the cash app on your way out. You've been a terrific audience, but let's have a special round of applause for Byron and Kirk. <laughs>